始めand gentlemen this is Lance's Legion war room again here's General Lance and we we're joined by Sergeant Barnes and Barbaric Disciple hey Barbaric Disciple thanks for coming on brother hey man how you doing I'm uh, doing good doing? dude I'm doing good man like uh, you know it's been a long time in the coming I heard that you got a book coming out is that right Yes, sir. I just uh, submitted to Amazon for publishing. Uh, we'll see how long it takes them to actually review the book. Um, <laughs> uh, hopefully not too long. Hopefully they don't catch my uh, attack on Jeff Bezos, but <laughs> we're hoping for the best. No, I think you'll be fine. I think the algorithm is not, the AI is not sentient enough just yet. But, I mean, who knows? I mean, I think, I, I you know, so many Amazon drone workers, like, they call them humans, but I, I'm very skeptical. I mean, you never know, you know what I mean? But, um, you know, it's been a long time since, I, you know, you've started posting on Twitter and, and a lot of your project it comes from a cumulus of different posts that you have and experiences you've read and obviously you're 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 an old stock American, right? If I remember correctly. Yes, um, you can find my my ancestry on my Twitter feed somewhere. Um, I am an old stock American on both both sides, fathers and mothers. That's awesome. Yeah, you know you don't really hear that often. You're kind of like a rare breed somehow. Because, I mean, even though I myself, I have, obviously, I can trace my lineage to um, the Jamestown Compact and all that. But, like, the de the deal is it's only through a select number of my ancestors, of course. It's actually very fortuitous that mm -hmm. you have, like, you know, you're full-bred American. That's awesome. I mean, truly, like, rare. rare. I'm going to collect you like a Pokemon, man. That's awesome. In, in uh in this day and age, yes, definitely. Dude, absolutely. <laughs> Although I don't think I don't think it's as rare as we we want to think. If I, if I had to put a percentage on it, I'd probably say at least probably around thirty percent. So I mean, that's a big number when you consider there's like three hundred thirty million U.S. citizens. Yeah. No, you know, like I I was thinking about that. You know, it, it, we always kind of talk about. Dem demographics and we talk about numbers and ratios and like as far as the populations and stuff like that and people I think tend to forget <clears throat> how much you can accomplish with so few men or so few people you know like uh, uh, I think it's really funny is if people ha blank out you know when they say oh 2% of the population controls everything but then they freak out when they say oh we're going to be less than half of a country I think that's only indicating it's probably a slip of the of your mind to or like an insecurity to say that oh you know we're not enough because we're a bunch of zeros we can't compare we don't punch above our weight which is actually why I like what you write dude because you know you read through a lot of his posts you know BD's posts you read it on it like you know uh, I have actually my own copy my special copy here at the battlefront of uh, uh, you know a barbaric vitalism and he talks about basically reinstilling values that make you punch above your weight that are the secret sauce to how we got here and you know I kinda wanted to ask you like I mean how do you see that you know like that saying uh, one man is 10,000 is if he's best I mean is that part of your project is that why you started this how did you start you know posting about this kinda stuff how did the project start oh man um I would say that I, I was very much radicalized by Bronze Age pervert. No, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no, I would say that, like, uh, I, I, on one of his recent shows, he says, "Oh, when I was a teenager, I was very Marxist." Is what Bronze Age pervert said, and like, uh, for me, very similar because I think you can't get around your upbringing. Um, I grew up in a very hardcore liberal family. Um, my dad was kind of kind of very much a hermit it wasn't like too like too involved in like he was there but wasn't involved and 
when you get brought up that way and then you enter the real world and realize the way that you're told the world works is not how it works you kind of can get radicalized radicalized pretty quickly um in terms of like my, my project like i started my my substack resavager uh, about three years ago actually last month um with just just a place to say what i want to say in longer form because Obviously, at the time, Twitter was very, um, what's the word? It wasn't friendly to our kind. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know. And so from there, um, I'm going to finish up by saying that, like, um, most recently, probably about a year and a half ago, I started something, like, I just started calling the Warrior, Warrior Religion Project. And, like, it was a combination of a couple of things. Like, I'd recently read Dune, saw the, saw the movie. And then I also uh, saw the whole thing happen in Ukraine. And then, like, uh, one one thing that was kind of, like, kind of inspiring was actually the Chechens. I was like, holy shit, these guys are over here praying before they march off the war. It was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the Chechens are definitely one of the most warlike people, especially in the modern era, I mean, in the Caucasus. I mean, there's this great Jocko Willink um, video about the experience of uh, 1991 Chechen war, which is when the Chechens actually had won. And this is where obviously uh, Putin had cut his teeth and, uh, you know, cemented his control and popularity in Russia. But just bringing it full circle, I think it's really interesting that a lot of frogs like you and I, I mean, like, you know, all, all the uh, frogs of the Talmudic network, you understand, uh, we're, we're like all kind of children of liberals. It, it's always very interesting to see that and how times and context change and I think there's something to it I think that it has to do with a portion of the the country that's idealistic vice simply conservative and which is why I push back on being called a conservative because I'm really not you know I have ideals myself and I think that you know man can grow into them over generations or something we can breed into that that ideal to more fully uh, represent that I mean Obviously, I look at the Resavager project, and I think that's what your vision is, is, is basically taking the American, you know, the, the man that was made on the frontier, that was bred amongst a population that had to tame the wilds, had to, like, brave the consequences of Indian raids and, you know, the harsh environment that that is the Great Plains and the uh, Sierra Nevada and, you know, the migration west. I, I kind of wanted to pick your brain, man, because, like, obviously you and I were both deep american dudes i mean is there some i feel like i read a lot about your your topic about americans and stuff what, what's your sentiment about that so yes absolutely um what with, with americans is that you grow up in a country that basically says that you cannot be proud of who you are unless you're something other than american and so when you grow up in that kind of attitude like you grow up you reach adulthood and you just kind of feel like one you kind of feel bitter you're like why the hell are all these people getting uh scholarships that i can't get because i'm american um i mean of course the word most people use is white and i, I don't like it because i think it's more we we consider ourselves more than white um recently i came across a, a book that i started reading about uh they're basically letters from robert e howard to hp lovecraft and you look in there and they don't really refer to themselves as white. Um, they, they prefer Aryan. They prefer Nordic. They prefer American. Like they don't, um, you, the biggest thing, um, that you get told is that America doesn't have a culture, that we're not a people. Um, we don't have traditions. Our traditions are McDonald's <laughs> and, uh, going to war for oil. But right. like, no, there is so much more than that. It's just, you don't get taught about it. And so that's the main reason, um, I kind of, my writing is geared specifically toward Americans for that reason. Uh, and, like, I get a lot of flack from that, especially from, like, uh, Euro the European side, because they, I guess they want to feel included, too. But I feel like they don't, they, maybe they deal with that problem as well. But for the Americans, it's just, like, that's what you get from the moment you go to school. You know, I think it's interesting because I, I do think that you're a cool guy. Obviously, you like you like everyone, you know. You're not like an asshole or something. And I think what they need to understand is <clears throat> just because your message is aimed at defining American, I think I think it will be a way for Europeans to be better understand themselves. 
And so, like, you know, people talk about, uh, you know, the big R word. I can't say it because YouTube would probably, like, you know, suppress me here. But, like, uh, you know, it's not simply enough. It, it comes with a certain ethnic cultural understanding and I mean you and I both love Nietzsche and we both understand that a people is a mission uh, they give themselves right like everyone has a, a grand mission to complete and it is my belief of course that Americans have their very specific mission I mean I have like my own theory of my own but like what what is it to you that is characteristically the center of being an American Oh, man, it, it is definitely would be the frontier. I mean, you look at it, um, even before um, our people came to the United States, like we were still on the edge of the known world, you can say, um, whether it was from uh, in England for the most part or even like Western Europe, um, compared to all the other peoples, we were kind of on the edge of what was known um, in that whole arena. So like our people thrived for being like on the edge of society, just like in the frontier, finding new space to conquer, um, or as our ancestors called it, manifest destiny. Yeah, you know, I I, um, I like that because it because it is it is interesting because I mean the Romans, for instance, you know, obviously no one has really explicated this. I think Nietzsche got was the closest, and he talked about how the Greeks were defined by the will to exceed all over all others. You know, that was the ultimate good, and the Persians were to tell the truth and shoot with a straight arrow. And I think to myself, how do you apply this to America, right? And, like, I remember, of course, you know, you read uh, your Federalist and Anti-Federalist and your early Revolutionary War founding fathers literature, and so many of them, even though a lot of these idiots in the Pentagon, they'd want to, like, tell you, for instance, uh, oh, you know, you know, we're, we're Rome, you know, so that way we could spread the big rainbow dildo and bash people over the head. You know what I mean? But the, the thing is there, there is a truth to that, yeah. that we are Rome. And so much so that the uh, early founding fathers not only LARPed as ancient Romans, but they even named, for instance, the Potomac uh, as a, as a code name, as a, the new Tiber. And they would name things like that. Uh, like they would just LARP like that in a healthy way, I think personally, but I think it's true too, that we are the main inheritors of Western Rome why? Because the Romans themselves, I think that their own spiritual mission was to dominate the entire universe, is universal domination. And I can't think of anything better, like, uh, encapsulating the American spirit than what we call manifest destiny, which is not just east to west migration, but domination of all the Americas. I mean, would you agree with that? Yeah, and... Uh to go back to what you're talking about with Rome, um, I mean, there could even be blood there. I just got finished reading uh, Albion Seed, which is a very good book on just learning about the different types of people that settled America. And um, a lot of people in the back country came from an area that was basically owned by Rome at some point. So there's Roman blood there, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, uh, Rome is very important. Um, our, we we model ourselves off of them for a reason. I mean, they were the greatest empire on the earth. The men were the like most manly, most noble men to probably ever walk the earth. They were just a, basically a city state, you can say, and they were surrounded by enemies. And they made their uh, mark on the world by changing the way war was fought. Um, before that time, like when two ancient armies would face each other. You would often, um, if one side took a devastating dis defeat, they would sue for peace. Well, the Romans, they would not do that. They refused to do that. They refused to sue for peace. They would fight to the last man. And, like, ancient armies didn't know what to do with this. This is why Hannibal <laughs> did not <laughs> sack yeah. Rome because they would not stop. <laughs> they just had no quit. <laughs> you just fucking right. psychopath, man. No, I remember that. I remember... Like reading, for instance, uh, after the Battle of, K of Cani and the Punic Wars, especially the Second Punic War, which is where Hannibal is, uh, Barca is, you know, most famous for, is that Hannibal basically won all the tactical engagements, so all the battles of that war, or all the ones of consequence, right? C you know, Trebia, Tresmine, uh, freaking Cani, and so on. But uh, what the Romans had was somehow the ability to, uh, like, the art of rule, the uh, art of being able to inspire their allies to stay with them. Also, the, the cynicism enough to kind of 
not live with our head their heads in the clouds as far as like moral questions as we consider them to, or to be concerned and yet also have the martial prowess and fortitude and uh just basically all around hard asses to fucking defeat and wear down the enemy so i think it's it's definitely one of those most interesting things because like you know i think to myself america for better for worse we're not in the same context like we weren't born in a context of war necessarily like of course we had the indians and of course we had uh the war of independence and then the you know war of 1812 but these things uh, especially I would say, like we we were are we now no but we were um no we didn't have like all those crazy wars that the romans had to deal with but we were always in danger there's always the frontier um at the very beginning, obviously, they had to worry about keeping the country that they had just founded. Um, so I, I would say that we did. But, of course, you know, uh, as a... Uh, what would you say? Victory has defeated us. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. And I, I guess I misspoke. What I mean to say is we were born in war, but after the Civil War, it's almost like war became a far-fetched idea. You know what I mean? It became something that happened somewhere else. And because we were so safe because of you know how amazing our ancestors were how amazing they were able at to to wage war to consolidate political gains that we kind of we let our arms get flabby our sword arms get flabby we let our hearts get fucking mushy and so i think that's probably one of the most interesting things if you don't mind me reading from your book uh, a little bit of a spoiler alert here because I think it was great, but like I wanted to read this passage you have about this allusion to Rome, which is why I bring it up. But yeah, go ahead. Here, here, here's uh, I'm reading uh, the Resavager, uh, Barbaric Vitalism. So here we go. We remember Rome as the mighty empire the United States modeled itself after, but little talked about is how Rome was founded by a gang of barbarians. The first Romans were men without a city or women of their own. They had to steal the women of neighboring villages with cunning and ruthlessness to continue their bloodlines. Hardly a noble founding by today's quote-unquote moral standards. I like that. <laughs> the men of early Roman Republican Republic exemplified barbaric vitalism. Their definition of virtue, in parentheses virtus, was manliness. Virtue didn't carry the same connotations it does today. It just meant that you were manly. Like the Greek Andrea, this is my own little note. The way to show your manliness to the Romans was through labor, strenuous exertions and ordeals made or broke men. In Rome, you weren't born a man, you had to become one. I think that was like, that is the equivalent, I say this all the time, I think books should read like meth and steroids at the same time and when i read that that shit got me fucking like absolutely pumped dude that was gas i love that and i think uh you know that's something that we forget and we, we blame the boomers a lot for all the pitfalls of where we live today but i think the reality is is that we were a victim of our success we were undone by our success and i wanted you to kind of go into that how is it that that idea kind of incepted yourself into your mind that idea of virtus oh man um it goes back to basically trying to uh i would say like most people in our sphere when you when you reach adulthood you realize the world is not what it is you have to figure out where you're going wrong and how do you fix it? Um, so for me, uh, it was a long process because I grew up as a kid. Like I, I enjoyed the heroic. Um, I grew up watching action movies, uh, superhero movies, stuff like that. <laughs> and so, like, I had this idea of what a man was. Um, but, but of course, you know, you go into the real world with what your parents told you, and so you're trying to figure out how do I get to that point to where I can be like a like the the Greek idea of heroic. And so my question became from how do you be heroic to how do you be a man? Because you got to be a man first. Um, <clears throat> and so like a question that I've had for a long time is wh what, what does it mean to be a man? And so that's kind of how my writing started because I was trying to answer that question for myself. Um, <clears throat> and so when you do, when you do that, like you learn, uh, you learn about the Romans and that's where uh, the word uh, the Romans used for virtue was we're too so it's spelled like it's spelled like virtue but it's pronounced a little bit differently um and you find out with the romans that you again you weren't born a man you had to become one like you became one through uh i don't know f fighting in a battle in a war um 
exercising your will, labor. Um, you have to do something that they would consider you a man for, like hunting. Um, and so that, that concept really, really, uh, it, it got me right in the heart. And like, it still does. Like <laughs> we, we live, we grow up in a world today where like, you don't have to do anything. Like you just become an adult. Um, and well, Romans, that's like you had to do something. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't that the secret though? Is that none of very there are very few men. I mean, people walk around. I mean, this is probably why I have some sympathy, so to speak, with the uh, the uh, the freak movement. You know what I mean? People that think that they're one thing or the other. Because at the end of the day, it's kind of true. There's no real men anymore. Like I, I myself, being in the military, like you'd be surprised how many effeminate like spiritual women exist in the body of a quote unquote man. And like, even in our schools from a young age, you're brainwashed into thinking being a virtuous man is following the rules, you know? And, uh, yeah, be when, a nice guy, you know, you gotta be good. Exactly. Um, I don't know if you were basically a, a good Christian man without actually being Christian. Yeah, exactly. And and I remember you, like you got to the point where in school, like not only does the bully or something get like if, the, if a bully fights you and you get caught right it's not even just the bully that gets punished but both people because of how effeminate the whole fucking school system is that they even punish yeah. those that <laughs> that like resist as if that's a good thing so you're teaching kids mm -hmm. that it's bad to resist it's bad to impose yourself to defend yourself to stand up for yourself in a in a positive and, and strong way and so i think that's part of the reason why there are so many pencil necks and so many dudes I don't know if you saw this, but there's a huge suicide rate, and it's been spiking for the last decade, constantly increasing. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that there are a lot of men out there that are truly men, but are completely despondent because they're in, they're born into a world where, it's like, you know, imposing oneself upon the world is considered the ultimate act of evil, and that is completely not the case. I mean, what what's your thought about that? Yeah, uh, I, I would take it back to, uh, I mean, I believe it just has to do with being born white, fortunately. Uh, you grow up in a world where everybody hates you, like, why would you want to be in that world? Um, <laughs> the, the, the trick to it, I believe, is you have to, you have to start being selfish. You have to look inside and see what you want from the world and what you're going to take from the world. Um, and stop worrying about, like, what everyone around you expects from you. Um, that exactly. to me is probably the biggest thing and like a lot of people do not learn how to look at themselves and try to determine what they want to do with their life mm -hmm. I think the craziest part is that people what people don't get is that people are waiting for permission permission to be manly so to speak permission to be this or that and at the end of the day being a man is realizing it's not waiting for permission it's just taking it you know what I mean and I remember this uh, great um, intro to The Departed. Have you watched The Departed by any chance? The Yes, yes, I have. Yeah, a long time ago. Remember <laughs> the, the Frank uh, Costello, he kind of does the intro, and he talks about like being Irish in Boston and how he's dealing with the blacks and so on. And basically he's like, the one thing the blacks don't understand is this, is that no one in this life gives you anything. you got to take it. And it's like, that's a, precisely the ethos that people forget because, I mean, say what you want, but the truth is that we live in an era of unparalleled, you know, naturalized Christianity of people that are born to be slaves with a slave morality, and they don't understand, and, and that's the worst thing you could do is possibly impose your own will upon someone else. And I mean, I wanted to kind of get your vibe for that, you know? Yeah, um, with how do I put this? Like, you, you got to understand that most people do not get, um, most people do not get our upbringing. They don't get a chance to say, oh, dang, I've been looking at the world completely wrong. They just go through life, they do what they're told, and then, like, their body knows something's up, and, like, I believe it manifests itself in things like depression, mental illness, that we see more and more in this world, because people are doing things that they're told to do. Is Like, this is what you have to do to live a good life. And they're miserable. And that's <laughs> why I believe most people, like, why, why we see these, like, high suicide rates. Um, just they're not ready for the world because they're given a, uh, what do you call it, a fairy tale version of what the world is. Um, exactly. Exactly. And so 
their their body knows like the body knows uh Nietzsche has like a very good quote about this uh the deepest uh let me see if I can remember how, how to say it the deepest wisdom is in your body like not, nothing what you know like the, your body's like evolved over however many long ho- however long humans have been around your body knows what's right like and we're taught to ignore it Yes, yes, the wisdom of your body is more profound than, like, some philosopher. I, I remember what you're yeah, saying. It's like a paraphrase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the guy's too big brain for me, you understand? It's kind of cool, though, because it's like someone as intelligent as Nietzsche is able to concede the fact that strong strong thoughts are not enough to overcome, a, like, a strong body. And I think that's the coolest thing is that he's the ultimate nerd, per se, but he kind of concedes and comes over to the jocks because at the end of the day, like, there's no dichotomy. There's no daylight between nerds and jocks. You are, like, either a complete person or you're not. And I think that's really great. In fact, you know, um, just talking about what we're talking about is, like, you've got to take it. As a man, you have to take um, your future. You have to you can't seek permission and especially now where your enemies are in power and they're increasingly not going to allow you to have a life that's happy or fulfilling or even like for instance they will try to deny your life like quite straight out as much as possible and a, a lot of being good is often being quote unquote bad i mean would you say that too yeah, but it's it's all the uh, the morality play. We're we're grew, we grow up in a uh, specific worldview that has a good and bad, and so the path that you have to take is bad compared to this worldview that you're raised upon. But it's not necessarily bad per se. It's it's bad for your enemies, but mm-hmm. for you, it's good. So it's called it's all it's called about uh there there's a uh, I've been on the internet for a long time, and so kind of what first brought me online, I would probably say, would be like the whole uh whole red pill game scene and they have it they have a saying called uh, you have to have frame um you have to frame the world like uh you can't let uh you can't let a woman um steal your frame you can't walk into the woman's frame you have to have your own frame and you can apply that to you, your entire life um you have to have the frame you have to imagine the world through your frame not through anybody else's yes dude i love that i mean honestly the whole game culture and stuff like that is awesome i mean i remember when i was like very very young and you know you go on youtube and youtube was wild those days like it was it was crazy the the stuff that you i mean it was basically iron march but like for like everyone else you know what i mean and uh i remember like in college because every every kid wants this to get jacked to get girls and to get rich right and i was trying to figure out how to get girls right and I remember talking, I was in a philosophy class, and this guy was pretty hilarious. I mean, this guy had a, was a philosophy major, right, and uh, this complete jerk-off, but he, he, he dedicated his entire college career into figuring out the whole game culture. And now he's like a, an influencer about the whole game thing. He lives in Vietnam and had just smashed roasties <laughs> his whole life. But it's actually kind of interesting because, like, uh, he's a Hapa guy. He's like half white and half like Vietnamese or whatever. So he looks exactly like Ke- Keanu Reeves, except blonde. It's kind of interesting. Okay. But um, I remember, it, like, you know, I would ask him questions and like to for him to tutor me. And he's like, you know, what we're gonna do. We're gonna go pick up chicks completely stone cold sober at the bar, and like that's how you kind of get over it and just like learn how to like do stuff like that. Now, not that really has to do with anything with resavaging or being like necessarily man per se, picking up girls at the bar, but it's about confronting fears. I think that's the the crux of like being a man is confronting fears, confronting adversity, embracing that unknown and going into it without having someone saying it's going to be okay or whatever. He's like, dude, you're probably going to have drinks thrown in your face. You're going to probably look like an idiot, but that's, that's part of the fun. You know what I mean? And so, so I love that. I mean, that's part of my fucking deal. And if you don't mind me reading another passage from your book, which is amazing, and it just talks exactly about what we're talking about right now, that kind of Promethean virtue. Hell, is even mm-hmm. called that, Promethean virtue. But I bing. Here we go. That's right. All right. A new warrior religion should acknowledge the unknown God, for as a people, we've strayed too far from the golden path to know the divine. We acknowledge, however, different peoples at different times have known the divine one of which is the ancient Greeks, 
who we trace back as the origin point of Western peoples. As origin, the Greeks leave behind wisdom in a manner we can understand and make use of. This world we live in can be seen in a Nietzschean concept of the Dionysian, but gone off the rails. Those who find their way to our side do so with an Apollonian desire to bring order to the chaos, but to embrace just the Apollonian desire for order is to set yourself up for wholesale destruction. Boom. You must understand that our enemies are not honorable creatures. They are rats and worms. They will pull out all the stops for the chance to stab you in the back without ever presenting a target. What you're up against is the antithesis of the noble excellence you saw in ancient Aryan warlords. What you realize is even they are a part of nature. Might is right in whatever form it takes. So where does that put the Apollonian man who seeks the favor of the gods? You must realize that the lion is always the fox. The ancient Greeks knew this to be true, which is why you saw their culture the domination of the Titans by the Olympians. Even after Aryan conquests took place, there were still cults devoted to the old gods. There's no ridding the world of either of these forces. In the sacred fire, I talked about the story Prometheus, an important Greek myth about how man should harness fire. They saw their mastery over fire as a crime against nature, a terrible sacrilege. This crime could not go unpunished, so Prometheus has his liver eaten out every day by the eagle. So what we all look for, what we all want, is that one moment where you can be uh, you can be Conan strangling the life out of like the tyrannical king of Aquilonia, where like you finally like get rid of the bad guy. Um, but the our enemies they they don't want that. Like they're not looking for that. They're not going to present that target to you. Um, you're not going to have any opportunity if you keep going down that road. You have to look for the paths to victory, and sometimes that involves like going into the underworld, as Bab says. You have to be able to. Uh, leave like not completely leave behind the, like the, your Apollonian view of the world, but you have to be able to go into the darkness, into the primitive, and do what it takes to win. Indeed, no, I completely believe that. I mean, you got to have you got to be a dynamic character, and which is why I think we run into this problem that you can go into the uh, Apollonian completely, but it's actually a weak structure you you start it's like a an old person you start becoming too so rigid it becomes brittle and you break apart you know fall away like dust but then at the other end of the spectrum it's like to be a liberal and to be completely like goo and just mush and never form into anything just like muscle you have to have a good combination of both right to be able to be like structure and at the same time be dynamic and um, I guess like to bring it back full circle or rather to, to bring it back to earth, what that means, man, is that you got to be like a complete human being. And I think the religions of the last past of the past 2000 years have completely, I don't know, like they've completely disinherited us of a vision of the world where we can be the best, you know, like you, where we can be like Homer's heroes. Everything else is about being a right. servant or a slave. And here's the other thing, too, is like what a aggravates me the most is that people want to be kings and warriors and, and, you know, the man, and then they ascribe to a religion that ritually calls them sheep. I mean, I think the greatest thing you've ever said is that we want to see ourselves as wolves, right? Right, right. Yes. Um, you, you have to realize that you can you can be the warrior you want to be or the hero of your own story or whatever you however you want to phrase it to yourself but the world you have to realize how the world works um what it takes to win in the world that you are in now um, a lot of people want to dream that they can go back in time and i don't know be, be a roman legionnaire or something but you can't like you're not there anymore you have to deal with the world that you have um now it's not necessarily a bad thing We're, we all have our um unique ancestry so i talk i like to talk about ancestry a lot because of that um because it feels like right now if you're if you're american like there's not a lot to be proud of it feels like you, we, we live in the gay empire as i say sometimes <laughs> um but you are not 
that empire. You're like you have a bloodline that goes all the way back to the beginning of mankind, and you only have to go back that far because your own American ancestors were heroic men. They were hard, warlike, and manly. And you see that in what they accomplished. They um, they went from what the East Coast where they first settled all the way to California, like inside eighty years, like less than a century. Um, they managed to reach like all the way across this con- like this country. Mm-hmm. Now, United States is not a small country. Like it's on par with China and Russia, the biggest countries in the world uh, in terms of size, like the vast scopes of land. Um, Jonathan Bowden, who I like to listen to a lot. Uh, whenever I feel like I need a pickup, he, he talks about how England fits inside Texas like eight times or something. Like that. <laughs> no, I, I, like I remember seeing this map of the United States juxtaposed over, like overlaid over a map of Europe, and basically Maine is in Moscow, as like uh, I don't know, San uh, San Diego is around where like uh, freaking Spain or Portugal is. Like the United States is a huge country, and if we're successful, be even bigger. Canada, 51st state, we already know. So, like, <laughs> at the end of the day, like, you're absolutely correct. Yes. And it's no small feat, man. It's no small feat, especially back in the day where there's it was unknown wilderness. You're trekking across the country. You got your wife on your back, and you got, you know, three sons. One of them is going to die from malaria or whatever. And, like, you got, like, daughters and shit. And you're by yourself in your blockhouse in Kentucky, you know what I mean? <laughs> In the yeah, Kentucky it, it territory. It was not easy, man. Like, what these what these men accomplished was not easy. And, like, the, what they did, like, it's still in your blood. Like, no, you you don't, you didn't grow up. You didn't get to learn how to hunt in the wilderness. Like, uh, like some of the people who settled the frontier, but it's still there in the blood. Exactly. And, you know, I think that's the coolest thing about Elon Musk is, like, I think spiritually we were very much akin to him because, uh, say what you want, he dreams about going out into the unknown, out into that the stars to colonize the stars. And like, I think you uh, you're a huge fan of Dune, and I, I love that you constantly post either it's Dune or it's Prometheus, and it's like this vision of like a galactic empire of like galactic vitalism. Like, you, just tell me about that, dude. How how did that come across to you as a revelation? Oh man, uh, part of it comes down to. We, uh, it's kind of like from an evolutionary standpoint, like mankind is done if it can't get off the earth. Um, so what I think drives the people is part of it is survival. Like, yeah, you want to do more than just to survive. You want to thrive, but you also have to survive. Um, and so for mankind to continue, we have to be able to get off the earth. And then you look back to American history, like we were taking that step. We were taking that step and then we're just dragged back into the weeds over over uh, civil rights. <laughs> um, so what, part of the reason uh, I talk about it a lot is because I believe that people have to have purpose. Um, as a collective, we have to figure out how to survive, like how we're going to survive when the time comes. Um, and you have to look towards survival, and that will motivate the people, I believe, to take the necessary steps to do what they have to do. Um, so like a purpose for people, that's why I talk about um, just the – the holy war because <laughs> you, you got to have a reason like you need to be uh if you don't have a reason you're just kind of out here trying to figure out um how you're gonna pay rent just like just meaningless stuff like you need to think beyond of what where you are right now you gotta have goals you know i remember reading hannah ardrent on the origins of totalitarianism a long time ago and what was basically on the mirror image what she left out in the whole thing is that Basically, she wanted to paint a picture that living a life of great purpose leads to death and destruction and terrible things and whatever. And I was thinking to myself, well, the inverse is probably a lot worse. You know what I mean? Because death visits us all. Whether people like it or not, you're going to die. Now, how few people live? How few people, you know, that's the crazy thing is that the boomers down to us and that what the liberals want or the, what they think is the best thing is about stuffing your ass full of food or drugs or like, you know, having a very cushy, cushy life. And the most that you can dream about being is, in the words of BAP, an interior home designer 
or you know some limp wristed uh, middle management office worker at a make 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 work job or working for the DMV. Even the military has this vibe where like in the military for the longest time, especially the Marine Corps, it was immune to a lot of the issues and social stupid conventions that we're having we're having now. But even now it succumbs to that rot because it, it shows itself everywhere, especially oh you dude, I wish I could I wish I could show you man, like there's these like general officers and stuff that like they have to uh pretend to be oh, you know, we're respectable people we do paperwork you know so they make a whole bunch of useless paperwork it's ridiculous but point being is that a lot of these people i think are so very much um they're not fulfilled they're not happy and that comes in spite of the fact that they're probably the most comfortable most well-fed and most uh i don't know cozy generation the world has ever seen I mean, uh, you know, people talk about decadence. I mean, Edward Gibbon talks about decadence and the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. But for us, when we talk about decadence, it's like this old-timey understanding. It's like full of gold and, you know, it's about sumptuous feasts of emperors and stuff. But I think people don't realize that the suburbs and having 2.5 cars and kids and shit and, like, having food and, and no true violence or, or trying times, like, real actual challenges and adversity is the greatest evil possible, and that's the form that decadence has taken. I mean, what what, what do you say about that? No, I, I agree with that. Um, it's, it's the true struggle, man. Like, you have to live... Um, you have to try to live for more. You have to try to go beyond... Um, to push like outside whatever conditions you're born into and like we're all born into our own like unique conditions but like you're you're in your body like i believe you have a bi biological drive to try to conquer that space that whatever space you're born into and to keep going on and if you're not doing that like you're, you're gonna be miserable like some people are just trying to go through their life because they're i, I believe they're just uh ignoring their uh their instincts their uh, biological instincts yeah, I think so too, man. And I think that's why Fight Club is such a... I mean, I'm sure that Steve Palinhook or Ch Chuck Palinhook does, hates us or whatever, but I think what his message resonates so much with our generation is that, like, you know, we kind of, like, sacrifice our entire lives. One day we wake up Monday and we go to bed and, and we're living for the weekend. And for what? To, to vegetate or whatever. And, like, I think that his, you know, story about how everyone really has a Tyler Durden inside of them. The ability to dream about who you can be. You can be more unencumbered yeah. by this kind of like materialist bourgeois life. And like uh, that's who you are. You just gotta you just gotta lean into it. You gotta yeah, exactly you gotta embrace the pain. I think that's what his story is, is that once you on the other side of pain is everything you ever wanted to be. And for the longest time that's what a military lifestyle was about is that on the other side of adversity and, and discipline and pain you were like exceptional and it was true for all other callings in life I mean not just the military but like you know whatever you want to do to be the best at something you have to embrace the pain but now now dude they don't they want to even take your pain away from you they want to take your pain away from you and they're stealing the best thing that could be possible for you to build you and like you know I don't know. I don't want to rant or whatever, but like, I think that's the 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 most dramatic thing that you re re philosophize and you kind of reformulate in your your little book here that I think people should buy. By the way, as soon as it's released, I'm gonna put it in the link below. You can check it out. You have to buy it. I re require you to buy it. Uh, but basically, yeah, is so this? I'll, I'll send start a car if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, exactly. And and like at the end of the day, man, like. Uh, you know, embrace pain. Pain is the secret to life. Overcome pain, move past it, yeah, and then embrace um, more. You know, and you'll see how big. I don't you know get. if it was. I don't know if it was Bap who said it, but uh, or I know he he's repeated it before. But like, there's no way that you can't like go into something like just something like working out where you're just trying to be healthy. Like you're going towards pain, and so when you do that, you tend to realize the the world isn't what you think it is, and like that. I think it's true for most people. It's true for me. Like even before um, I learned anything I did that we learned here on our side of uh, the internet, like I started working out and all of a sudden, like my world changed. My worldview changed completely. I was, 
uh, I started detesting a lot of the stuff that we hate today before I even knew any of this stuff. All right, right. I think we got cut off there. We're just back right now, Barbarian. But yeah, just going off what you said, brother, like, absolutely. I think one of those things is, you know, lifting. So many people talk about, you know, having ideas, having the right convictions as if it that changes anything. And, and to a certain extent, and here's where I kind of disagree with Nietzsche, is that I do think that we have agency. I mean, he, he's very famous for saying that we have no agency. But I would say that that's, that's an overcorrection because, remember, Nietzsche's there writing against two millennia of Platonism and the idea that conviction trumps uh, material ends. However, I would say this, I would say that like absolutely that lifting is the next uh, step after agency because you can't, you got to put work to what you say, right? And um, bring an alignment to what you believe with the truth. In any case, I would say this, brother, like I'm really grateful that you write, wrote that book because like obviously, I think you've said this before on Twitter, uh, that, you know, it's not even part of the same conversation as Bronze Age Mindset. Obviously, it's on a, diff a different league. What I would say, though, is that, like, your book definitely hits hard and hits home parts that are kind of left out of that book and definitely kind of gives a positive vibe. Are you, by the way, working on a second book by any chance? Oh, man, right now um, I have ideas for it for sure, absolutely. I don't have, uh, it's kind of more in, like, brainstorming phase of where I wanted to go there were some things that were kind of I guess revealed to me as I was writing this one so yes um, not anytime soon um, because there's still a lot a lot of work that goes into <laughs> writing a book like this is my first time try, trying to uh, write more than a little like 1,000, 2,000 word essay for uh, for Substack so mm -hmm. <laughs> no I totally get that dude like it's definitely tough and I mean I know that you were writing your previous book for a couple of years now, so it's like it's not like a walk in the park, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, probably I would say there there was a uh, one one article I wrote. I think it was called um, it was either "Religion Governs Culture" or "War is Father." That's kind of when I decided I was going to write a book. Now everything I wrote past then didn't make it into the book, um, so. Uh, but most of it did show up on the Substack. Killer, killer. Well, brother, I really appreciate you coming onto the War Room. Me and Sergeant Barnes are absolutely delighted to have you. And certainly, I already bought your book. It looks incredibly sexy, by the way. So good job on that, too. And uh, I would say this. Obviously, on the link below to this transmission for the War Room, if you, you Legionnaires are listening, I'll have you uh, get the URL for his Substack, which is the Resavager su uh, Substack, correct? Is that what it's called? Yes. And yes. on top of everything else, the link to his book. Please support our friend here. Um, I mean, he put a lot of effort into it, but also it's actually worthwhile. You know, I don't, I don't give people the plug for books that are just out there, just a cash grab. I think that this is definitely a great ancillary um, resource for anyone that wants to be able to read something concisely spoken and in good humor and good health, something that you read. And like I keep on telling y'all, you want to make sure when you write, it's like meth and steroids. And definitely this book is both those things. I mean, it really got my dick hard. So I really appreciate you, Barbarian. Right. I really appreciate you, brother. And do you have anything to say yeah, before no we problem. head off? Thank you. Uh, no, man. Thank you for having me on. Um, again, th thank you to you is because you did um, actually put, like, put it in my mind. You're probably one of the first people that came up to me and told me that, hey, you need to put your writing into print. And again, man, when you're kind of writing into the void on, on Substack, man, that's a lot of help. Um, definitely keeps you from getting demoralized. So thank you. Hell yeah, brother. Hell yeah. All right, man. Well, I think it's time to uh, set off in our U-boat. Uh, we've made port for too long, and it's definitely time to make it back to Libya. In any case, we're signing off here. This is Barbarian Disciple. This is General Lance, and this is Sergeant Barnes, War Room, Lance's Legion, signing off. <laughs>